Hey everyone, I am back with another sketchbook session video where I'm going to show you how I did this with watercolor and gouache and I'll talk about my process along the way as well as just whatever comes to mind. So grab your sketchbooks and pens and pencils and gouache and watercolor or whatever you feel like painting or drawing with and let's be sketch buddies today. <laughs> everyone and welcome back to another chatty sketch session. I've chosen my colors. Uh, today I'm using a bit of a different palette. I'm using cadmium free lemon yellow, burnt umber, Prussian blue, and quinacridone magenta and of course white. So my first layer is going to be very wet and loose and flowy and just kind of establishing the overall um, like feeling of the painting I guess and also to help me visualize what's going to happen and I'll start with a very loose sketch but I'm sure it's going to evolve over time okay so what do I want to do I want to have um, like a pathway I think the forest that is inspiring this painting is super super mossy and there are a ton of trees that have like multiple trees growing out of one root base like huge trunks coming out of the same place and I really like that you definitely need to have like a fallen tree somewhere so yeah spray that down so first thing I'm going to establish my brighter tones and I'm gonna actually go kind of overboard I'm gonna have the light coming in um, actually how do I want to do the light actually I'm gonna have the light coming in through this way so <laughs> it's gonna catch the left sides of these trees uh, so yeah, I'm going to go a little overboard with the color, with the under layer color, because most of it will be covered up later. So this is more of a, it's just a way for me to kind of get a general feel for the lighting in the painting and establish some of the major shapes maybe. And I want it to be really deep and dark in some of the areas. We recently went on a hike at one of my old fa favorite forests, the one that we used to go to quite a bit when we lived near Inverness. I call it Fangorn Forest because it just reminds me of that and it's so beautiful. It's so enchanting. It feels, you literally feel like you're in Middle Earth when you're there. It's so amazing. It's going to be dark on that side. But yeah, um, it was the first time I took my drone there though, which was interesting. And I got, basically my goal was to see if I could find which of the trees were the tallest because apparently that forest has some of the tallest trees in Britain. Um, and I was like hunting for them in this, from the sky. <laughs> it was really fun, but I couldn't quite tell. It was just the wide angle of the, of the camera on the drone just wouldn't let me really see the perspective properly, like the scale of the trees. They all kind of just seemed really tall. They were all about the same. Uh, so yeah, it was a, a fun fly over, but I didn't really learn anything from it. Um, but then we just kind of walked through the forest and I took lots of photos and videos and really just enjoyed the atmosphere. Okay, now that's my base layer, really quick and loose. I'm going to tilt it so that it flows away from the center of the crease because I don't want it to like 
pool up there as much. Hopefully it won't bleed through to the other pages. I've had that happen before. Okay, I'll be back in a second after it dries. Do -do 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 -do. Through the magic of editing, <laughs> the painting is now dry and way lighter. Let's take a look at the inspiration. So these are a few photos from our little walk in the forest. And I'm not really copying any one reference photo. I'm just using them all as inspiration as a whole. And I'm kind of making it up as I go. So a couple things that I pay attention to um, as I'm doing this is, first of all, I'm trying to practice uh, getting better at painting more variety in my forest instead of just like a flat forest floor with trees sticking up and you know, whatever. So I want to have like variations in the floor. I want to have mossy rocks and roots sticking up and like, you know, clovers and ferns and all of the various details of the forest. And the other thing is when I look at photos like this, it's the perfect example of what I try to focus on in my forest, which is contrast. So in order to draw the focus to any specific area, I try to use, well, light obviously, but contrast in particular. Since this is a really wide scene, I'm gonna draw interest to this area by having really bright brights and really dark darks. And then to draw focus to this area, I'm going to use color. So instead of having like a drastic contrast, it'll be lower contrast, but the colors within there are going to attract attention. So most likely it'll be like deep dark greens along with some purples because those are complementary colors. They kind of play nicely together and it'll just be like a cooler, more shadowy area, but because there will be a lot of, um, like compliments and lots of little details that will hopefully kind of keep this area interesting. So yeah, between those two things, hopefully the eye will sort of flow back and forth between the two sections. And this is a very long painting, obviously. It's much easier when you just have this much space to fill, <laughs> like choosing, a, choosing an area to focus on and that's pretty much, that's it. What, when you have a really long page or a big canvas, you kind of have to think about how the eye is going to move around in that bigger space. I like to look at my color charts to get ideas of how I can use color or contrast in this specific scene. So for instance, if I use my, if I look at my brownish tones or even my warmer tones, I can use these in the pathways and the tree trunks to kind of draw focus. And of course the vibrant greens will be visible in anywhere that there's like bright sun coming through the leaves or ferns or just like highlighting the edge of a moss or something like that. And then that will be contrasted with the cooler, deeper tones. Okay, <laughs> now I know these are super teeny tiny charts. It's because they are actually only half of a chart. The other half is taped to my bedroom window, um, which I'm using as a light fast test. So I have to work with these little ones. Um, I'm gonna eventually make a bigger version of these charts, which basically it's just pure color mixed with white. Uh, and the reason that I like having this version of my chart is that one thing that works well for shadowy forest areas is to use really deep colors, like almost straight out of the tube or mixing like your really dark darks. And then for anything that is highlighted, but isn't necessarily hit with direct sun or backlit by direct sun, you add a bit of white because it will desaturate it a little, but lighten it as well. So you get that luminance, but it's still shadowy and it's not going to give you that like bright sunny look. So it's, it's highlighted. It's obviously standing out from the dark darks, but the viewer will understand that those highlights are not in direct sun, if that makes sense. I don't know if all of that was just gibberish, but it made sense in my brain. And I'll just, I guess, show you as I go what I mean. So I've set up my gouache. I may use more than that, I'm not sure, but um, because I already have an underlayer down and some of that will be peeking through, uh, that's maybe all I need, we'll see. So while I'm going to be mostly using this, I may just touch in hints of the watercolor here and there. They play really nicely together, so sometimes it's just fun to do that. 
I especially do that a lot when I'm outside painting. If at any point during this painting I am just going silent for a while, like I jump into focus mode, <laughs> I'll just throw some music over the video to chill out to. By the way, this is not a tutorial or a paint along. You're more than welcome to sketch along with me, paint something you want to paint, but please don't just copy what I do. If anything, just use the tips that I share to make your own scene. I would really appreciate that. <laughs> I mean, I'm not like, oh my god, I can't believe someone copied me and posted it. Like, it happens. I know it happens. And people sometimes even tag me. Um, and, and it is really flattering. <laughs> um, but it's, it's less flattering when it's not a tutorial. Like if I just do a personal piece of art and share the process, I don't mean for people to copy that. <laughs> I have specific tutorials out there for people to copy. Um, but it's just the way that the internet is and if you know I am really happy that people get inspired and want to paint and um, like spend their time with me so I never want to be like mean about it but it's just like a friendly reminder that if something isn't a tutorial online if you come across a video that's not specifically labeled as a tutorial uh, you might want to just get permission to uh, copy it if that's what you want to do. They might be cool with it, you never know. But yeah, I hope you just have fun sketching or painting, whatever you're doing. Knitting, perhaps. Speaking of knitting, a lot of the sheep in our area um, are suddenly bald. <laughs> they have been sheared and the wool has probably gone to market. It's always funny when you're, you suddenly drive down the street and you're like, oh, the sheep look so different. They're so skinny. Actually, sheep look kind of muscular without their big fluffy wool. It's, it's always a shock when I see them for the first time after being sheared, because otherwise they're just like big fluff balls in the fields. <laughs> I need to concentrate for just a second while I sort of wrap my mind around the colors in this painting. Something I found helpful is when I do a scene like this where there's a lot going on, um, I kind of attack it in chunks. So like first I'm thinking about this area where the sun is pouring through. There's going to be a lot more like high contrast stuff going on and in general some warmer colors. So at the moment I'm sort of still in a watercolor mindset. I'm painting around some of my highlights and those being like some of the tree trunks um, and maybe some of the edges of some leaves or something. And then once I sort of get further along in that stage, I'll probably then start covering things up more and painting a little bit thicker. I don't know why I just, the more I paint with gouache and watercolor, uh, because I love both so much, I can't just like choose one and only do that one thing. Um, the more I, paint with both, the more I love combining them. And my mind just tends to work in like a watercolor mindset versus a thick gouache mindset. So sometimes it's fun to use really thick gouache. I, I really do enjoy that. Okay, sorry, I, I darkened the camera just a little because I noticed it was really bright. Um, but yeah. Uh, especially after I've been working on like big acrylic or oil paintings, I'm in that opaque mindset. Then when I go to use gouache, I use it more, I use it thick like that. So I guess it just depends what I've been doing a lot of. Oh, and also speaking of acrylic, I finally have been making some progress on my big pathways series, uh, which I'm using mostly acrylic for. Well, I mean, I used gouache for some of like the concept sketches, but the big canvases are all acrylic. There's a certain level of comfort using acrylic because it dries quickly, it's opaque, it's permanent. <laughs> so you don't have a lot of the struggles that you do with gouache or oil. Uh, and, you know, it is a little different to work with, like the consistency and 
Um, yeah, just like maneuvering it on the canvas, but it's uh, after you get the hang of it, uh, it can be a very fun, rewarding experience. Pushing lots of paint around, just, I don't know, I just love it. <laughs> and you can use oil on top of acrylic because acrylic obviously dries permanent. It's like a, f a solid permanent film. Um, and sometimes it's fun to do like most of the painting with acrylic and then do some final fun little blendy beautiful sections with oil on top of it. Um, although I have heard that it's better if you do that you should maybe um, seal the, the ac acrylic painting with a transparent gesso or ground so that the oil can kind of adhere better to it. Perhaps it depends on what kind of oil you're using or your technique. Okay, I'm kind of trying to keep this little background bit slightly more muted. So I'm using a bit of burnt umber and white in my mixes. Just knocking down that vibrant green just a bit because in the these trees and like this tree this general area is going to be more of the focus kind of draw the attention there and then again i'll talk about the other area later but i'm always a bit of a chicken when it comes to uh, laying in my darks like, I should just know by now that in order to be, to have this contrast, I obviously need, I really want my bright brights to stand out. I need some dark darks in there. And yeah, it's, it's like, I just struggle to, to go that dark straight away. I've always done that, especially with watercolor. Oh my gosh. If you look at some of my really early watercolors, if they're very pastel because I just never went dark enough. And then there came a point where I was like, screw it. <laughs> I'm just gonna like put a lot of pigment on my brush and just go for it. And little by little it got easier. I was, I was thinking just now, like how, um, like when you guys paint, do you sort of visualize or channel a specific style or even like an artist you've seen, like, do you think about their paintings and, and the style that they have and, um, or maybe not style, style is probably the wrong word, uh, technique. Like if you stare at an artist painting for long enough, you can sort of start to understand and see their technique. Um, for instance, when I look at Nathan Fouke's, his work, I can see he uses big brushes. He uses really quick brush strokes. Um, he lets the colors kind of sit next to each other sometimes instead of blending everything together. It's kind of like a broken color effect in some places. And both wet into wet and dry brush technique. And of course those are techniques that like every artist uses, right? But I think because I've just seen so much of his work, he, he inspires me so much that those visions are always like fresh in my mind. And I don't want to be like influenced by any particular artist when I'm painting. Um, so what I have to do is like those visions just kind of come in and out of my mind and I have to immediately stop thinking about them and change the subject in my brain <laughs> because I'm afraid that if I don't my paintings are going to look like someone else's like without without even realizing it I don't know if that's just me it's I feel like it's kind of inevitable if you do look at art something is going to stick in your brain subconsciously maybe that's a good thing maybe that's not for you I don't know it just depends on on each person, I guess, but. Okay. 
think I've established some decent progress in the background there, but I forgot I wanted to add a couple rocks because there are a lot of rocks in the forest here. And I tend to like ignore them. <laughs> I don't know why. Um, and they are covered up by moss a lot of times. When I do these like sketch videos, I'll have people comment things like, um, like as they're watching me paint, they're like, oh man, I don't know how she's going to save that painting. Like, <laughs> I don't know how that's going to recover, which makes me laugh because I'm, I'm thinking the same exact thing as I paint it. I'm like, Ooh, when it's in the ugly phase, oof, that, that mindset creeps in and it's like, how am I going to do this? <laughs> How the heck am I going to make this work? But I just keep going and I think about the principles of light and color and, and yeah, it just, it, it comes together in the end. But I mean, the only way it's not gonna, like, it's always worth it to finish it. That's kind of how I see it. Because if you don't finish it, you never know what it could have turned into. You're just letting fear stop you or frustration, but maybe the frustration comes from fear of failure. And a lot of times, even if I finish something and it's awful, um, I can use, I, I can observe it and, and see what didn't work about it. Like, why is it awful? What is it that's making me annoyed in that painting? So yeah, it's a, it's a really good learning experience either way. ears just like started um, ringing really loud. I have whatever that is it tinnitus? I can't remember the name of it, but whatever the thing is where you get really loud ringing in your ears. So I know I've been painting this one area for a million years. Um, so what I need to do is let that totally dry and then I can come back with my final shadows and highlights. Next, I'm going to move into this area. Sometimes having a really messy brush stroke is the perfect texture. Trying to make a transition from the, the warmth over here to the cooler tones on the right. This looks like total chaos. But you know what's fun about that is with perseverance, if I stick with it, like I was just saying, it'll definitely be worth it. I know I can. I can make it work, but it doesn't happen in an instant. <laughs> it happens after lots of layering. I'm just, the thing I struggle with is I want my paintings 
to have life. <laughs> I want them to feel alive, like active, like have lots of visible brush strokes and like evidence of the artist in there. Not just like perfectly rendered leaves and branches and trees and rocks and blah, blah, blah. That just, ugh, that just bores me. <laughs> and it's so hard to keep the life in there and not over render it. So one thing that helps me do that is to, like I said, I work, if I work in areas, I'm thinking, okay, that's pretty far and it still looks very like loose and active. Before I go too far on that, I'm gonna move to this section. And then at some point in this section, I'll have to let that dry completely and kind of step away from it to get a better feel for the whole thing. Um, but yeah, working, giving myself a, not like a time limit per se, but stopping myself from going too far in any one area. And then by moving on to a different area, it keeps me distracted from like continuing to over render one specific area. If you, if you have a lot of space to fill in a painting, that is a little easier. If it's a tiny little painting, that can be difficult because yeah, you might just sit there and just end up over rendering and losing all that life. Don't get me wrong, I love looking at realistic art and observing how someone did that and just it's very very impressive to me and like for instance um one of my favorite art movements of art history is the pre-raphaelite art movement if you go google that you'll see what i mean really quick it's very realistic but it's very dreamy at the same time but and at the same time i absolutely love contemporary abstract landscape art. So humans are multifaceted. <laughs> the algorithms online want to keep us in a box and organize us, but you know what? We are we are way more complicated and have way more depth than that. So what I like to do with my rocks a lot of times is um, any of these bright white areas that I have left, I kind of see them as rocks peeking through. The only time you would ever really see the white in the forest still is if it, if there's like leaves or something that's glistening that's catching really bright light that might be super bright but it's probably not even pure white so yeah for some reason when i look at these bright spots i see rocks and it makes it a little easier to kind of plot those out <laughs> if i just touch a little bit of gray on there then i'm like oh yeah okay that's that's definitely a rock and from there I can start like rendering them more and more okay we definitely need some deep green shadows around this tree because um, again I'm trying to draw the focus here so I'm going to use more saturation and more contrast um, and that could either be with color or value. value. So I'll start with like a base for, for my, um, oh, I'm also like definitely gonna put moss on a lot of these rocks because most of the rocks in this forest are drenched with moss and clovers and stuff. I want to make sure I um, capture the roughness of the moss just using my flat brush and s kind of smashing it against the paper to get that really dry more paint on there. This is why my brushes don't last long. <laughs> well, some of them do, but a lot of times I'm really abusing them and then the bristles, I don't know, if, and then the bristles start to fray and then I have to chop those off. But yeah, um, So I'm gonna use a cool purple in the shadows next to these greens. 
which is going to help with that uh, visual, that, that contrast. Um, and I also want to make sure I get some variation in the pathway because it's definitely not just like a, a smooth, perfect path. There's lots of rough stuff. Um, and then where the trees are getting light, I'm just gonna warm it up a bit. I'm kind of glazing, which you might not think is possible with gouache, but glazing just means you're diluting the paint and layering and layering and layering. Um, and if you let the underlayer dry and just use one or two brush strokes, um, if, you, if you rub it, you'll definitely reactivate the paint that's below it and you won't be able to glaze. But if you just kind of go and sweep that thin down gouache on top of it, there you go, glazed. <laughs> um, since I'm using Prussian blue, I have to be careful that I don't, I basically can't use the Prussian blue like straight out of the tube because it's so insanely bright. It will just instantly de detract from everything else that the eye will be, be like totally drawn to that. Wherever I'm using it, I just need to make sure I mix it with something. Um, whether it's the yellow or the brown to kind of knock it down just a bit. I'm gonna let the shadow carry across both pages to kind of bridge them together. And also need to make sure there's no like white. Sometimes along the edge of the tape, I'll get, um, I'll accidentally leave some like white bits bristles don't like get down into there. So one thing that's happening here is like the angle is not okay. So the pathway angle and the angle of this um, tree are basically parallel. So in order to continue drawing the eye that way, I need to have a couple shadows that are more uh, horizontal, like straight across. It doesn't have to be literally straight, but just like a little bit more leaning that way. Um, cause otherwise the eye just like goes and falls off the edge of the page. Um, but I'm also going to have the pathway continuing this way. So for instance, maybe a bit of pinkish salmon-y color over here. Um, kind of dropping that in that dappled light effect. I'm gonna come back later and do more tree branches and stuff like that. Uh, but for now, let's move into this corner. So in the very foreground of this area, the contrast will be a little bit higher. Um, so first I'll do my darker bits, like the base foundation of the rock is gonna be a lot darker, but then I'll come back on top of it with the mosses and the highlights and stuff. I'm keeping everything, I'm keeping my brush strokes really loose at this point still. So just doing like big chunks of color to sort of establish the shapes. And then once that's down, oh God, I just dripped on it. Danger. <laughs> uh, once those big chunky shapes are down, I start and I'm kind of seeing the scene unfold a little bit more. Um, it's easier to come back in and um, cut away at shapes or like add more detail, whatever you need to do. Again, I'm not trying to turn this into a tutorial. Uh, I'm just sharing some insights that will hopefully help you guys in your own scenes. Like whatever you decide to paint, whether it's a forest or not, you can apply a lot of these ideas to those scenes. I don't know, 
something I'm very interested in patterns lately. Like, how do I explain this? <laughs> Even though I don't see something in nature or in a reference photo, like for instance, these big chunky patterns, these shapes, um, whether it's a shadow or a light brush stroke, uh, I love being able to see that in the final painting. So I don't want to cover all of that up. They sometimes are just used as stepping stones and building up the depth of a scene and they'll be like covered up in the end. But other times, or maybe I should say the more I develop my aesthetic, the more I paint and the more my style kind of shows through, like I love leaving those weird quirky bits in the painting. It's sort of like a juxtaposition between the really weird abstract side of it with the realistic side. So in the end, you'll be able to tell this is a forest, but there's going to be some weird going on in there. And I just love that. <laughs> All right. So before I get any further on this section, I'm going to develop this a little bit more because without developing this, I can't know how far to go with this side. And they're, it's all part of the same painting, right? So it has to work together. So one thing I've noticed is that this, the light in this area is suddenly just gone right here, which may or may not make sense. I think I need to bring back just a bit of, of light back there. So, you know, just touching in hints of that, of these trees. Um, actually, no, because then the tree looks the the tree has to stand out from there so i actually have to darken that next to that tree <laughs> it's all about relationships i said i was going to stop working on this side but i'm <laughs> i keep i'm drawn to it um yeah so what's happening over here the overall feeling is going to shift to cooler uh, also, I think I've mentioned this before, but usually I like using a much bigger brush than this, but I'm just experimenting a little bit with mark making, which is why I'm using a 3 8 inch brush. It's a lot. I mean, this is way smaller than what I would usually start with to block in the bigger areas. Um, so it is definitely a challenge for me. <laughs> Sorry, I need to concentrate for a second. <laughs> Um, what I think I'm going to do is lay in some very shadowy blue and then build it up from there. Just kind of bridge those areas a little bit. Okay, so thinking a lot of ferns and stuff, a lot more shadowy. The other thing that's a little trickier with gouache is that it has that value shift so when it's dry it may look a lot lighter or a lot darker so sometimes in a painting like this you have to lay it in see how it dries and then make adjustments um, which can take a while if you're using a lot of paint and filling in a big area so you just have to be patient. Although I suppose you could use a heat gun and speed up the process. Okay. I'm just at the moment trying to think about like where my path is. Um, speaking of which, I need to make sure, because I want this to be a very, I want it to feel like you're going deep into the forest on that side. There's like some light coming through over here. Which direction will you choose? The path of light or the path of darkness? Neither can exist without the other. There'll be just a hint of warmth in those two trees where it's just catching the light, but it's definitely going to shift down to cooler. Okay, so I've put some sh shadow on those trees and I've realized my background is not nearly dark enough. And I'm, like I said, I'm a big chicken. It takes me so long to lay in my darks. It's like, just, just do it already. <laughs> it's 
really fun to work with a limited palette um, because you can't have every single color in the world. It forces you to get creative with like, what are you gonna use as your highlight? What are you gonna use as your darkest dark? My darkest dark is really close to black because of the colors I chose, but sometimes that's not possible. Um, however, I'm choosing like stylistically making a decision to use um, either blue black or purplish black, depending which section of the painting I'm in. It's um, I want the shadows to have that color. <laughs> I want it to feel colorful still versus like a really neutral black black. These colors are so pigment, like highly pigmented too, highly saturated. So in order to make them not quite so insanely bright and, and intense, I should say, I have to constantly mix with their complement. So, or, or at least with the burnt umber. Like for, since I don't have orange on my palette, blue and orange are compliments. I will take a little bit of like, let's say I'm starting with my blue. I'll get a little blue. Wow, that's bright. Okay, so I'll take a little bit of green and it's like, oh god, that's super intense. That's like phthalo green. Okay, so grab a tiny bit of the brown, kind of knock it down a bit. And then if I want to do even more, I'll take a little bit of the quinacridone magenta. And then I'll just keep going until it's neutralized enough. <laughs> um, but you can see I'm working with rather thin layers. I'm not going super thick and I still have all this paint left. So it just depends on what I'm like. Sometimes I do like working thick. I've said this already. I don't want to repeat myself, but yeah, it's I think because I've been using watercolor so much, especially outside that I'm currently very deep into the watercolor mindset. By the time this video is out, I may have already done my August Patreon paint along. Uh, I do paint alongs every month for my Patreons with a private stream. And we are doing, for August, we're doing waterfalls with watercolor. And it's a lot of fun. I love painting waterfalls so much. Uh, but for September, I will be doing a hybrid watercolor and gouache like this. Well, my camera battery just died and the memory card was full. So I had to take like 20 minutes to deal with all that. So I made some coffee, had a little break, and it was good because I was able to step away and look at the painting with fresh eyes, which is something I say all the time is it's so helpful to just take a little break, look away for a while, do something else, because when you see your painting again, you immediately know your problem areas become so much more obvious. Even though this painting is only half done, I could still really see some things I need to work on. <laughs> so it was good. It was a blessing in disguise. Let's just say that. Plus, I get to catch up on one of my favorite YouTube channels. I've been binge watching a channel called Tyler and Todd. Tyler and Todd are a gay couple in Canada, and they were living in an RV, renovating RV, RV life kind of videos. And then they moved into the Canadian forest and have been building a like dream cabin getaway thing. It's it's amazing. They have such a good mix of like helpful tips for building and renovating things and just wonderful traveling and sightseeing and and their relationship is just so beautiful. They're so funny. <laughs> like it's, it's just like one of those channels that is great all around. So anyways, I watched a couple episodes of that. It's so funny to think about how like uh, you, when you watch something on YouTube, it almost feels like you're watching TV and you kind of forget or it's easier to forget that. No, like those that's somebody's real life. The, someone you're not watching a tv show you're watching someone's life but i think because their videos are just so high quality it almost feels like it could be a tv show and it's also good to remember that because like you can idolize things really quickly really easily online like social media 
it's dangerous when you start comparing yourself to something on social media because um, yes, even though it's real people, it's their real life, a lot of times the, the stuff you see on social media is just the good side of things. <laughs> like you don't really see a lot of the problems that people go through or the hardships. Um, and obviously some channels do share a lot more of the realness, which is awesome. But yeah, you just gotta be aware if you start if you start comparing yourself to someone online, like really step back and remind yourself like, okay, they also have problems. <laughs> like they have to pay taxes, they have to go to the DMV, they have to do all the things that you do. It's not all glamorous and perfect. But I think actually that's another thing about Tyler and Todd's channel is they actually do show a lot of the struggles and hardships, um, which I really appreciate. Just by watching their videos, I feel like I could maybe someday like renovate an RV <laughs> or build a cabin in the woods because they've taught me so much. What was I saying before the camera died? Is it something about Patreon? Like, I think I was gonna say that by the time you see this video, I will have been doing my August paint along already. But for the September paint along, I'm gonna be combining watercolor and gouache. So it'll be kind of like this technique, but with a different subject. And I'll do a full like talk through of everything. So if you're interested in that, make sure you are signed up during September. Probably better to do it in the beginning of September because that's usually when I start planning the paint along and I make a little announcement. Um, and yeah, like don't want to miss that. So it's been raining nonstop for the last 12 hours. So the kitties are constantly coming and going, running in and out of the cat flap. <laughs> And because they're so spoiled, because I'm a crazy cat lady, whenever they come in, I run down and I dry them off with a little microfiber towel. They come in while I'm painting. I won't be doing that. And then they're gonna get mad. There's a couple swoops of darker blue to highlight some trunks over there. Oh my gosh. <laughs> now I have this song stuck in my head that Tyler and Todd use as their intro. <laughs> I'm gonna start some details. Okay, so the last like 10% of the painting takes 90% of the time. That's my experience. <laughs> So I am going to continue working on the painting in focus mode. I'll throw some music on. I might make this end bit a little more of a time lapse um, because it takes so long to just build up those final details. And this video could easily be like four hours long because <laughs> um, when I'm talking, I'm also painting a lot slower. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and do that and I will talk to you towards the end of the video. Okay, so I'm getting close to the end. Like I said, I don't want to overwork it. Uh, I still really like, I really like the kind of vibe that it has right now. I don't want to, like if I keep going for too much longer, I will start blending too many things together and losing some of these like really bold, loose brush marks. Um, there's a couple things I have to adjust before I end. But yeah, I'm happy with how it's turning out. Of course, it's one of those things where like you can always do more and keep going and keep going. I think I say this in every single sketch video, <laughs> um, but 
at some point you just have to make a decision that it's done and you are just going to learn from it. So, you know, I try not to sit down and, and like put the pressure of like, oh, this has to be a masterpiece. I try not to do that to myself. I try to sit down and think, okay, this time I'm gonna try this and we'll see how it goes. And I always learn a ton and then I take that experience to the next one, the next painting. And I just progressively grow because I'm painting a lot. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's, that's the process. <laughs> um, so I wanted to touch up a couple of these trees. They were just kind of getting sort of lost. I had ignored the pathway and I wanted, I originally wanted it to be more varied. Most of these forests, like if you walk away from the path a little bit, you end up knee deep or higher in ferns. So I really like getting those fern textures. Sometimes they just look like tall grasses, um, but that's why I kind of like fan it out a little bit. I think I got my point across. <laughs> like having that transition from bright sunny patch in the forest to deep dark shadowy bit. I love that feeling when you're walking through the forest and it's like you're entering a different world almost. Okay, so let's end it here with a tape peel. If you made it this far in the video, thank you for spending your time with me. Don't forget to press the thumbs up button. And if you aren't already subscribed and want to see more in the future, make sure you do that before you go. Okay, I will see you again next Saturday. Cheers, everyone. Take care.